Dear respected Thai, dear Sangha, today is the, the 4th of December in the year 2016, and we are in the upper hamlet. During this winter retreat, we only meet with the 4 4 Sangha only once a week on Sunday. And for me, it's a very precious opportunity um, to be with everyone in Plum Village, the all 4 4 Sangha. And um, really happy to be able to sit up here and to see everyone. I've been reflecting on my own practice and um, every time I go back to the practice, go back to myself and and examine myself and how my practice is, I always feel deep gratitude to to tie into the Buddha. And I I'm always in awe of of the Buddha because his awakening had touched so many lives over twenty-five centuries. And it's continuing to affect lives everywhere. And Thai had been a really wonderful instrument to really um, help many of us come in touch with the Dharma. Many of us were, were able to put the teachings of the Buddha into practice in our daily life, that the practice becomes, the practice and the teachings become accessible and doable. And we're here today because of these two people, the Buddha and Thai, of course, many other ancestral teachers but very intimately Thai and also the Buddha. And after, um, after his awakening, the first teaching that the Buddha offered was on the fourth noble truths. And it's really a, this teaching brings good news to us that, yes, we, we suffer, there is suffering in the world, but there's a way out of this suffering. That suffering is manageable. And I'm always really um, intrigued by, um, by the first noble truth that suffering is holy. It's a holy truth. And I always question myself, why is it that suffering is a holy truth? I mean, none of us really want suffering, right? Suffering is not very comfortable. There's an echo, right? There's an echo. The sound is okay? Okay, yeah. And, um, and it really made me look suffering, look at suffering differently that is not something unpleasant and something unwanted. And that suffering is holy. And so it really helps me truly examine why is my suffering 
how can my suffering be holy? So this is an invitation for every one of us to look into our suffering and to see its holiness. Just question ourselves or question this suffering. Why is it that it is holy? When we look into our suffering according to the fourth, uh, the, the four noble truths is that we'll see the causes and conditions that, that had brought about the suffering. And we will also see that there's a way out of suffering and that happiness is possible. And every one of us um, who are here today had been somewhat motivated by the suffering that we had experienced in our life. The, ex the suffering, the confusion, the uncertainty. And we want to find out how to come out of this suffering, how to transform our suffering, how to, how to experience happiness, how to be happy, how to be peaceful. And the theme of this winter retreat um, the, for the Dharma talks during this winter retreat is on the eight noble, eight noble path. The, the eight noble path is really the path to happiness. It's the fourth noble truth, which is the way out of happiness. And in the previous two Dharma talks, we have heard about right view, right thinking. And today we have an opportunity to explore the right speech. But let me go over what the, what the eight noble paths are. In the first Dharma talk of this retreat, we, we heard about right view. Right view. And then there's right thinking. Right livelihood. Right diligence. Right concentration. And right mindfulness. When we look into these eight different practices, we can see that they're not really separate from our daily life, that they're part of our life, and that these are the eight different practices 
that we can focus on in order for us to cultivate happiness and also to manage our suffering. And um, these, these are the right path, the path leading to happiness. But there's the wrong path, the path leading to suffering. And instead of right view, right view, it's wrong view. Instead of right thinking, it's wrong thinking. Instead of right speech, it's wrong speech. Instead of right action, it's wrong action. Wrong livelihood, wrong diligence, wrong concentration, wrong mindfulness. So we can really look at this and see whether we are on the path of happiness or the path of suffering. We can look into this one of these different aspects and see whether it's <coughs> right or it's wrong. If it is wrong, it leads to suffering. If it is right, it leads to happiness and peace and transformation of suffering. And um, and so, during the whole winter retreat, if you're staying here for three months, you have a chance to learn all these different practices, the right practices, in order to go cultivate happiness, peace, and love. And if you're here just one week, no worry. Because if you practice one really well, you're actually practicing the others as well. Because they are interconnected. These eight noble paths are interconnected. So, for instance, today we're going to talk about right view. For us to have right, I mean right speech, Sorry, pointing at this. For us to have right speech, we need to have right thinking. So right thinking is needed in order to have, to have right speech. For us to have right speech, we have to have right view. If we have wrong view about ourselves and about other people and about the world, our speech will not be right speech because it comes from a place of suffering and a place of wrong, a belief system that does not, um, that does not bring openness and that does not um, bring peace. And it, then it's no longer uh, then it's not right speech. And the same thing, mindfulness is intimately connected with right speech. Or well, right speech is intimately connected with right mindfulness. And today, this is what we can explore, how to practice mindfulness with speech. So that speech, it's right speech. It's loving speech. And so the other are also very intimately connected also to right speech. And also, it's the other way around. Right speech affects the other um, seven of the Eight Noble Path as well.
But what is right speech? But before we look into right speech, we have to say, what is wrong speech? And according to, to the definition of um, wrong speech in the sutras, in the discourses given by the Buddha, um, and also in the trainings, in the mindfulness trainings, we'll talk a little bit about the mindfulness training in a bit. Wrong speech is speech, it's, that's not true, lying. <coughs> Wrong speech is when we speak, when we use double tongue. Double tongue means you say one thing to another person, but when you go to the other person, we say the other thing. And these two things conflict with one another, and it creates conflict between people. Mean speech, unkind speech. And another, and another definition is exaggeration. Sometimes we blow things out of proportion. Yeah, the truth may be like this, but we make it like this. So these are definitions in the sutras. And so right speech or speech that helps to transform and bring happiness. Right speech go in line with right view and right thinking. And it dispels disharmony, misunderstanding. It brings people together. And it helps people to, one, to understand one another. And so, speech enables us to communicate with other people. We're social beings, so this is, this is a really um, an important aspect of our life, communication. And, um, and a lot of time, our suffering comes from miscommunication. And so in the five trainings, we have one training that talked about right speech. In the 14 mindfulness training, we also have two trainings that talked about right speech. Because this is really um, a really important part, um, an important practice that could help us to, um, to really open our heart and to really be in the skin of other people and to help other people to really be in our shoes as well. And I always wondered when I learned this eight noble path, is how do I, how do I actually put them into practice? They're not just theories for us to understand what the path of happiness is, but how do I apply them in my daily life? This is the kind of question that I always ask myself when I learn, uh, uh, I learn the teachings given by Thai or discourses that I, that I read or, or talks that are given by my siblings. Is how do I really practice this? Because if I can't really practice them, then I can't really take these insights and these wonderful teachings to be mine, to be part of me, to be my own insight and my own experiences. And this is what Thai always encourages us to do as well, is to always ask in the teachings that we learned is, how do I really apply this? How does it affect my life? And how, I, how can I use this teaching to cultivate peace, to cultivate happiness, to cultivate love, and to manage and, and embrace and work with my suffering? So I, will, I would like to share how I practice this, and how we practice right speech.
I'm aware that in this community, this fourfold community, there are many of you who are so versed in the teachings and practices um, of the Buddha, of Thai. Many of you have been here for a long time, seven years, 14 years, and much longer. And um, and my own, and I realized that the only thing that I can share in a talk like this, it's really my own experiences, because my own experience is uniquely for my own practice and how I practice in, with these. And so I thought this may be more, more um, maybe useful for each one of us to look back to ourselves and to find ways for us to practice because maybe each one of us practices differently, we're, we're different, and um, something works for us that may work for other people. And so we need, we need to explore different ways for us to practice. And Thay always encourages us to be creative in how, how to apply these teachings into our daily life. And so talking about this reminds me of um, a really beautiful mind. It's called the beginner's mind. And um, now that Thai is no longer teachings and the, the Dharma teachers are coming up here and teach, um, I always wonder whether my siblings are able to really benefit from the sharing of their older brothers and sisters or whether it's you know, they've learned much deeper teachings and practices by Thai. And here we are just sharing our practices. I wonder if it's really, um, really, they're, 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 they're receiving it as they would receive Thai's teaching. So I'm questioning my younger siblings. And, um, and I'm reminded that I, I, it doesn't matter, and it doesn't matter how my younger brothers and sisters are receiving the teaching. What's really important for me is whether I have a beginner's mind in myself. They may have their beginner's mind, but do I have my beginner's mind? Because when I have a beginner's mind, when I maintain this beginner's mind, I'm so enthusiastic with the teachings and practices. When we come, when you first come to the Dharma and to the Sangha, we're so open to learn. Everything is so novel and everything is so wonderful. And um, Everything, we're just drinking everything, sucking everything that's been shared, either by the teacher or by friends in, in Dharma sharing groups. But as time goes on, we no longer have that enthusiasm. We no longer have that openness to learn because I know it already. I know that. So, it's something that we really have to, or I have to examine in myself when I listen to a sharing. What does what this, this sharing has to do with my life? How does, how does it help me to strengthen my practice and to progress on my path? And so it's really important to keep this beginner's mind 
Because without the beginner's mind, our path stops short, that we no longer progress. When we stop, it also means all habit energies, all suffering, all way of looking at the world. also come back up in us. So it's really always important to keep beginner's mind. But then, you know, sometimes I think where these suffering, these belief systems that I have had brought about so much suffering for myself, and maybe when they come up, it's also an opportunity for me to see that I have stopped on my path that I'm no longer progressing, and that it is an opportunity for me to refresh my beginner's mind. Because when we have the beginner's mind, we take up the practice wholeheartedly. And the very basic practices that we do, this, they're basic, but they're, they're, the, they're the foundation, they're the essen essential practices that help us to go, to progress further on our path, and that it, it stays with us all our life. It's not like I do this in the first two years of my life or the first seven years of my life, and I don't do it anymore. And their practice to cultivate mindfulness, to cultivate insight, to cultivate awakening in ourselves, these practices include breathing, mindfulness of breathing, mindfulness of walking, mindfulness of eating, mindfulness of recognizing what's unfolding in ourselves, <clears throat> mindfulness of our body, mindfulness of the suffering that's there. When we are embracing these basic practices, we are actually practicing the Noble Eightfold Path. And so mindfulness helps us to examine ourselves and to see ourselves clear and deeper to see the roots of our speech, our action, and our thinking. And um, and yesterday, or the day before, a young sister told me that her sister, who's um, her older sister, who, who doesn't who doesn't know the practice and who doesn't practice, asked her, how do you know when your meditation is successful? In other words, how do you know if you're, you're really practicing? How do you know if the practice is really beneficial and useful? And that it ha how do you know if you have really um, embraced the practice. And I thought, wow, what a, what a wise question. It's good, for, it's good for her to hear this question from her sister, because it's an opportunity for us, for her, to look at herself and to look at her practice. And. Um, And so, how do we know we are practicing? You know, we can't, other people can't really measure our practice. Nobody can really measure our practice. Sometimes we can't even measure the practice ourselves. We can't really gauge our practice at all. Sometimes we think we're practicing. 
sometimes we think that we're very diligent and we're so concentrated and so mindful. And then we look down on other people. Oh, she's not walking very mindfully. She's all over the places. So we start to judge other people. That's a sign that a beginner's mind had eroded. And it's also a sign that we're not really practicing. And I and and for me, for me to gauge my practice, there's several things that I use to gauge where my practice is. First thing is my relationship with my with other people. Not just external relationship, but in here. When I close my eyes and bring up, bring up an image of someone, how does it feel in here? Is my heart constricted? Do I feel uncomfortable? If I do, it shows that my practice has not been too well. It shows that I need, I need to really take refuge in the basic practices. The other thing that I use to gauge my practice is in my daily interaction, what kind of things come up inside me? What kind of feeling do I have? What kind of mental formation do I have? Is there judgment? Is there irritation? Is there criticism? Because if there are, then I know I have not really practiced really well. If I'm angry all the time, then I'm not really embodied by the practice or embodied with the practice. So that's another good way to really see where our practice is and where our beginner's mind is. We may be on the eight ignoble path instead of on the eight noble path. We're watering us, we're setting ourselves up for suffering and we're watering negative seeds in ourselves. So these are really good way for us to reflect and to examine ourselves. And um, and speech is one of those things that's quite difficult to really work with. Many of us have speech issues. How many of you have speech issues? Do you think you have speech issues? A lot of us. When I, um, when the Dharma teachers met to decide who, who would, you know, when the Dharma teachers would give, we take turns to give the talks and the topics, and I have chosen something that I was really comfortable with. And then toward the end, we were like moving because we were like shifting around. And then at the end, I realized, hey, I would write speech. That's my weak spot. And I thought, how in the world am I going to share about right speech when it's my weak, it's my weakness, something I have been working with all my life as a monastic. And my sister said, well, why don't we share about your suffering of, with right speech? <laughs> and... Um, 
So um, I was quite nervous about talking about right speech because every, almost every shining light session at the end of the winter retreat, the sisters always shine light on me, on speech, on my speech. And um, even though I sat there and I said, there you go again, the speech again, I knew it's really useful for me to hear that again. Because I realized that sometimes the Sangha has clear, clear view of me than my own, than myself. Because when I speak, I don't think I'm using wrong speech. I always think I use right speech. Honestly. <laughs> the other um, couple of days ago, we had a Dharma teacher meeting. And after the Dharma teacher meeting, a young sister, a young Dharma teacher came up to me and said, wow. That was strong. She was talking about my speech. And she said, you know, if you soften your speech a bit, you are like a refuge for so many young sisters because you're so strong. The young sisters are scared of you. And I said, I know, I know, I know. But I can't help it. It's my grandparents, my dad. In other words, this is something that I have worked with. I see in myself the combinations of things that might make my speech quite strong. They're not unkind. I don't lie. I don't use double tongue. I don't exaggerate. I'm just strong. <laughs> and... Um, First of all, my family, everyone in my family have strong speech. You know that from Brother Pap Dang, right? <laughs> <laughs> you see how family members are so similar. And because we've received the same kind of genes, the same kind of seeds from our parents and our ancestors. And so, that's one factor that makes our speech not right speech. And it's really good to be able to see that because when you see where your, rights, your, your wrong speech is coming from, then you have more compassion for yourself. You don't beat yourself down for you know, being strong or being mean. Because transformation happens when we are able to see the root of our suffering and also to accept, accept ourselves. So I accept that and I understand completely what that sister is sharing and I can see where it is coming from. The other element that made my speech really strong is that I'm really impatient. That's another thing that the sisters shine light on me. Um, every year for the past 20 something years, <laughs> really impatient. I'm getting better though, I have to say. Um, but it's another element because when I'm impatient, I don't listen. You see, right speech. A loving speech goes really closely with deep listening. Because when you don't listen, or when you're impatient, you want to give a response right away. You have this wonderful idea. You want to share this wonderful idea right away. You're not really listening deeply. You're really listening and preparing, listening to yourself, to what you want to say, and then preparing to respond or to give an input. And so that's one of my soft spot.
So deep listening is really um, a really important practice because love and speech, or right speech, depends very much on the capacity to listen deeply. Because when we understand what the other person is trying to say, what is, what is not said, you know, we listen between the lines, we can really see the suffering of the other person. And when you really see the suffering of your, the other person, your response will be different. It's not coming out of like a reaction of wanting you know, to fix things, of this impatience. <coughs> and so over the years, I, I, I learned to practice listening, listening more, more than speaking. I listen. And I realized that when I listen, then the sharing that I said afterward goes in line with love and with peace. And it goes in line with right speech, loving speech as well. So, It's not just about listening to other people, but it's about listening to myself as well. Because there's this thinking happening inside my head all the time. My speech depends very much on this inner, inner dialogue inside. If my inner dialogue is one of peace and love and calmness, or if my, the inner dialogue has quieted down, then the quality of my speech goes in line with right speech, with love and speech. And so this is a practice that I do to my, with myself, is listening to myself. Listening to this voice inside, listening to this conversation, and I realize that in the back of my mind, there's this beehives that goes <laughs> talking all the time. There's stories that's created. There's all kinds of things in the back of my mind. It's endless. It's an endless voice in the back. And, um, and we have to be able to listen, because when I listen, I realize that this inner dialogue is the motivation for me to say in certain things, to think in a certain way, and to act in a certain way. And so understanding this inner dialogue helps me from falling into this habit of speaking, of acting, and of thinking in ways that had brought about suffering for myself and suffering for other people. So we need to listen to this inner speech, our inner speech. And uh, being able to listen to our inner speech can take us very far on the path of transformation and healing. And another thing that made me really um, made made it really difficult for me with speech, or my sisters always shine light on me, even though they didn't know where it was coming from, apart from, you know, my ancestral transmission. Is that, and my impatience is that, I feel I'm so transparent. As you can see already. This last half an hour, you can see how transparent I am. In other words, I cannot hide, which is really good. And I'm always really grateful for this transparency because whatever that I feel in here, it's expressed on my face, 
and in my speech and in my action. And this is a suffering that I have, you know, all my life as a nun. Well, the earlier years, because I realized that because I'm so transparent, I get so much criticism and sh strong shining light. Whereas people who are like, you know, like they put on this serene face and they don't express so much what's in here. They have like flowers on their path. <laughs> and, um, and so it's something that I always have to like, you know, work with, work with myself. Not, not, not to not be, not to be less transparent, but to transform from my core, to transform from the depths of myself. Because if I transform from here, then what comes out is just light, right? And beauty, right? I'm hoping. <laughs> and so this is where I focus my practice in transforming the depths of myself because I cannot hide. And so what comes out has to come from that place in here. And one time, one of the sisters shined light on me around speech again, that I shouldn't be speaking Vietnamese to the Vietnamese sisters. And I'm like, what? How can I not not speak Vietnamese to my sisters who don't speak English? Because, because the problem is that I came to Plum Village with very limited Vietnamese. And my Vietnamese, I learned it here. And so I don't understand, like, sometimes I translate in my head, and the words I say, it's so neutral in English but it has such negative connotation in Vietnamese. And I didn't know this. There's like different shade, you know, to like words that, that I have no idea. And so what I said is just really neutral. When it's heard by my Vietnamese siblings, it's really strong, really harsh. And so I thought it's ridiculous not to to shine light on me and say that I shouldn't be speaking Vietnamese. So it's something that I've been really reflecting on how, how, um, how to avoid words that has um, this negative connotation. But, and when I'm impatient, I don't stop to think. <laughs> That's the problem. And so all this combination of things made my speech really strong. I mean, heard from other people being really strong. But for me, I think I'm using right speech. So it's a continual process for me in refining my speech, in softening my speech, in using right speech. And I'm getting better. I have to water my own flower. I'm getting much better. And so it's important to be able to see where our wrong speech is coming from. Many of us suffer from speech, that it's important to be able to see that. Because seeing the causes and conditions that made our speech unkind, 
or made our speech, um, that our speech is bringing suffering to ourselves and other people, that it's really important to be able to sit down and reflect on where it is coming from. Because when we see the roots of our suffering, or of our unkind speech, it's already halfway transforming it. We just need to be more diligent in recognizing it and in cultivating the seeds of kindness in us, the seeds of love, the seeds of peace, so that our speech is coming from that place. And, and wrong thinking also, wrong perception. Wrong perception is really wrong view. Um, wrong perception is it's the main factor that made us have wrong speech. So our practice is to be able to recognize perceptions we have of ourselves. What kind of what kind of image do we have of ourselves? What kind of self-image do we have we created for ourselves? Do we have of ourselves? Because every one of us have an image of who we are. This image comes from family upbringing, a family situation our upbringing, our education, our society, people around us, there's just so many factors that sort of feed this self-image we have. So in other words, it's a perception we have of ourselves. And I realize with my own contemplation is that this perception that I have my, about myself, this self-image, really limits me from allowing my true self to blossom. It's a limit way of seeing myself and that there's so much more to myself than this self-image that I have of myself. And that if I'm able to like put it down, this self-image, not to like identify myself with it and really trusting that this is me, I have an opportunity to see myself much larger than this self-image. And that I allow myself an opportunity for to cultivate potentials in myself that I did not know existed. Because I'm so, you know, stuck with this self-image. And it's the self-image that creates suffering. When someone does something or, or say something that I feel threatening to the self-image of who I am, then I'm ready to fight. I'm ready to flight if needed. So that's where the problem is in relationship, in communication as well. So it's important to be able to recognize, to sit down and write down, what is it that we think we are? The self-image we have. Where is it coming from? Where are these ideas coming from about ourselves? And how do we progress from there? Are we willing and able to let it go, to put it down? Are we able to, to allow ourselves a chance to, to be much more than these ideas that's been molded and created by the many conditions in our life? So these are the, these are the kind of things we do in meditation to reflect on ourselves and these, and these things. The practice of shining light 
it's a really wonderful instrument. Because like I said, I don't see my speech being wrong speech. But my sisters have sh shared with me over the years that my speech is too strong. And I had to, I had to look. At first, I was really reactive in, in here internally. That's not true, you know. What I said is not like that. But, but, but the shine light, the shining light really helps us to see parts of ourselves that we can't really see. Maybe because it's habitual. Things that are habit energies are very difficult to recognize because it becomes something that's so automatic and so habitual that we do them without even thinking. We do them automatically without second thoughts that it made it really hard to recognize habit energies. And so the Sangha can help us to see our habit energies. And even if we think that they have wrong perception, it's always really good to reflect on what was being shared because it may help us to see ourselves um, less subjectively, I suppose. It helps us to take one step back in order to, to see ourselves. And another, another wonderful practice that we have, the practice of communication, it's beginning anew, beginning a new practice, that we have this practice where we sit down together with the person that we have issues with, or with the community, and um, we learn to practice using love and speech and deep listening. And this is a really, really wonderful way for us to understand the other person, but also really helps us to see our habit energies that we may not otherwise have seen. And, um, and we have to do this as often as we can not just waiting until the Sangha convene, you know, once a month or once every two weeks to do beginning anew, but we have to do it every time there's tension or hurt or conflict between ourselves and another person in the community. It really helps to open communication because with this practice, we have to practice using love and speech and deep listening, because without love and speech and deep listening, the practice of beginning anew would not work. And having the support of another person can really help a third person, someone who's neutral, someone who's stable, to sit there and support us to do beginning anew with one another is really important. And um, And the other person can help us to see ourselves a lot more than what we can see in ourselves.
And all these practices, they're not, they're not, they're not um, like beginning a new or shining light. They're really wonderful tools. But we have to be able to do them wholeheartedly. Because if we don't use them wholeheartedly, if we don't use them as tools for deepening our understanding of ourselves and other people, they can be the other, they're like a knife that can be really useful, but it can also hurt very much. This is a season when we are already starting to be a shining light in the new hamlet. And, um, and so it's appropriate for us to reflect on this in order to, to make the best use of these two these practices. And so these practices help us to really, um, to really make use of the presence of the Sangha. We, we are making use of other people's insight and experiences and vision in order to help us to help us to understand ourselves, to help us to, to recognize our suffering, and to help us to see the way out of this suffering. Because it's only when we are able to recognize the suffering that we are able to do something with it. Because if you don't see that you have this shortcoming or this, mis this, this weakness, with this habit energy, you will, never, you will never be able to work with it. You will never be able to do anything about it. It's when we see our suffering, we admit that there is suffering, that I'm suffering like this, that suffering becomes holy. And when we are, only when we are able to see our suffering deeply, that we can see the causes and conditions in our lives that had watered and brought about this suffering, that have reinforced this suffering. And it's through being able to see these different, these wrong ways, these eight wrong ways that had contributed to the suffering that we turn to a the eight noble path, the path of no, the the eight, um, the noble eightfold path, in order to transform our suffering and to cultivate understanding, love, and peace. And so, the four noble truth is really a wonderful gate, a wonderful tool for us. They're not just philosophies and ideas or beautiful teachings. They're really practical suggestions given to us by the Buddha. And this is the very first thing that the Buddha had offered to us. And they're really important tools for us in cultivating, for us in, co in progressing on our path, our spiritual path, in transforming ourselves and becoming happier, becoming an instrument, instrument of peace, instrument of love, in helping us to wake up. The Buddha is an awakened one, and the Buddha is offering us these tools to help us to wake up as well, so that we can be an, an awakened person, just like the Buddha himself. So thank you so much for, for listening, for being here in the community, for practicing together. Um, everyone is really um, a mirror for us to see ourselves, and everyone is a light so that we can rub onto one another, so that we can, our light can shine brighter every day. So, thank you.